Okay. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So Jen, I just wanna start off by thanking you for having me here with everybody tonight. Um, I, like Jen said, we've known each other for years and I just, uh, I adore Jen. And um, she's really been an integral part in me kind of finding my purpose um, after cancer. So I'm Kate Crawford, I'm a patient-centered health advocate. I was diagnosed at 28 with metastatic breast cancer. It was HER2 positive invasive ductal. At the time, my kids were, I had twins that were four and my son had just turned three. And we had found out not too long after after I was diagnosed, I had some genetic testing done that I actually had something called leaf frown syndrome, which is a genetic predispositionary um, cancer mutation, which leaves me more apt to get colon cancers, um, uterine cancer, cervical cancer, just all different types of brain cancers. Um, so I actually have a um, a very strict regimen of things that I have to go by. I've already had pre-colon cancer. So I get colonoscopies every few years. I have had um, pre-ovarian cancer. So I've had my ovaries and my uterus removed. I've had a double mastectomy. Um, because of how long I've been in treatment, I also have chemo induced cardiomyopathy, which means that my heart doesn't function as well as it should. And I've had about 150 treatments in almost 10 years. I've been living, um, with metastatic breast cancer. And when I was first diagnosed, um, they actually gave me about 18 to 24 months to live. And they did not think that I was going to make it. And I did intense chemotherapy for every single week for the first about a year and a half. And then we dropped really hard chemo. And I've been on just a targeted immunotherapy ever since then. I live about an hour and a half south of Pittsburgh with my kids and my husband. And I like to pretend that I have a farm and we have a thousand animals, which I wish I could say was an understatement, but it's not. I have a lot of animals. So I like hey, to Kate, refer to my- I'm sorry, your, yeah? camera, your camera isn't on. I don't know if you could switch it on anyway. Uh, my camera? Yeah, I can't see your face. I don't know if anybody else can. There you go. Is go. that better? Yes, that's good. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, good? Good, excellent. Okay, so I like to refer to life before cancer as BC. Uh, so often we look back on our life before cancer and we think, about how easy it was and how normal it was. And it actually, when you get down to the nitty gritty, it isn't as easy and as normal as we actually thought it was. So my life before cancer, even though people often ask what it was like before cancer and how normal it may have been, it, it really wasn't. I, I've had a very um, hard time becoming a mother. My first daughter um, that is in the bottom picture with me passed away. Uh, she lived for three days. She had two birth defects. And then we went on to have my twins that were born premature. And then we had my son who was born about eight weeks premature. And not very hard his first few weeks of life. He was in the intensive care unit. He's had strokes. Um, he had a lot of uh, disabilities growing up. Uh, so life before cancer was 
it was really rough when I, I think of it. Um, it was my normal, but I don't think that someone else looking in would have said to me, well, you know, that, that actually is normal because the things that I was going through at the time, it, it wasn't easy. And although I do look back and I, I miss a life that didn't have doctor's appointments for me, it was still filled with doctor's appointments for my son. It was still filled with much grief after losing my daughter. Um, my husband and I also went through uh, a lot of, um, you know, marital problems after my daughter passed away, which often happens um, after losing a child. So, you know, when we think about, you know, like I said, like that life before cancer, there's one thing that we all had in common before cancer was even on the table. And that was sorrow and grief. If you think about life, it, it is the one thing that everybody does have in common. You, you're not going to meet somebody without them saying that they have never been through a traumatic event or they have never had something terrible happen to them. We all have that, that thing in common. So when we're looking at life after cancer and what we do, one of the, one of the things that I love saying is find your gifts. You wanna find things that you love. So our passion drives our purpose. I think that after being diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer and basically being told that um, I would not be living very much longer, I kind of have this second chance at life. I, the very first year that I was diagnosed took a, a hard look at how my life was going. And although it was a life without cancer. It was very fast paced. We had a lot of things going on. I often was overworking myself. I was saying no too much, especially to my kids. And I wasn't doing things that I enjoyed. So cancer has really given me the opportunity to look back at all those things and really evaluate them and find my passion. So some things that I've done uh, just to kind of, you know, find this, this second chance at life here is actually started going back to school. There's a lot of programs out there that help cancer patients get degrees and certifications. Uh, there's a lot of um, things through the state that's available to us. Um, for us to get rehabilitated, to start back into the workforce. Another thing that I did, which is one of my favorite things, is I started a bucket list. And I know that a bucket list might sound a little cliche, but I will tell you, uh, with having such young kids at home, having a bucket list has actually really helped my family heal. It helps my family go through um, really dark places in our cancer journey. And it, it makes us closer to be able to get through those. So living with metastatic breast cancer means that you are in treatment for the rest of your life and you're constantly at appointments. There's always something happening, um, whether it's a surgery or an illness, or I've had blood clots, like I could go on and on and list all of the things that have tried to kill me. But the one thing that has always kept us going was having this bucket list. So we, we knew that even if I was going to be in the hospital and, you know, mom was in the hospital for two weeks and she was so sick and we almost lost her. But then she came home and we took a trip to Maine or we stayed at home and made a fort. My kids always had something to make up for all of that lost time that they had with me. And creating those memories to me is going to be something that really outlives cancer. And then the next thing that I like to do is I, I love to help others by giving back. I 
say yes a lot now, <laughs> not just to my kids, but also I just love volunteering. I love giving back to the cancer community. Um, I love sharing my story. I love letting people know that they're not alone, that you know, even though they're facing these trials that I promise one day everything will be okay. Another thing I never gave up on was dreaming. There have been many times right after I was diagnosed that I thought to myself, this is it. I can't do this. I am never going to finish my degree. I'm never going to own my business. I'm never going to do all of the things that I've dreamt of doing. But having that bucket list actually helped me to be able to continue dreaming. So I am a very creative person. And if you're a creative person, I really think that finding your gift of being creative is such a great way to drive your passion and find that purpose. So for me, I love to draw on the iPad, like the picture. I love to um, make t-shirts. I love to dye my hair in fun colors. I love to get my nails done. Like there's so many ways that you can be creative. People tell me all the time, you know, that they're not creative. They're not artistic, but being creative and artistic doesn't really mean that you're a good artist because Trust me when I say I cannot draw, I can draw stick figure and that's about it. But there are so many other ways to be creative and really use that as a therapeutic tool for yourself um, when you're going through something bad or you're recovering. And then the last thing that I personally love is writing. I think writing is such a great tool to have. And when you're writing, you don't have to write for the whole world to see. You should write as if no one is ever going to read it. You can write your, you know, deepest, darkest, personal feelings just to get them out. And in fact, I had started journaling after my daughter died and I journaled for, um, I think nine months after she had passed away. And I journaled just about every single day. And I remember one day I, I had something in my head and I was so afraid to tell anybody, but it, I wanted to say that I hated my daughter. I hated that baby girl. I hated her because she died and I hated her that she didn't live. And I know that sounds absolutely terrible, but it's how I felt. I, I felt such anger and I just was so mad. And I knew if I said it to somebody that they weren't going to understand what I was saying. So what I did was I wrote it in my journal and all of these years later, she will actually be 16 um, this January. I, I love of being able to look back at my writings and see where I was. And I can still feel that very raw, very real emotion. I can still tap into that. I can still go back to that, but I don't stay in, in that place. I'm able to feel those feelings and then kind of look back and see how far I've actually come. And I started journaling around the time that I was diagnosed um, with breast cancer as well. And uh, one thing that was really good about that was I actually put a lot of information in there that I don't remember, <laughs> mainly because of chemo brain. I just can't remember some things that happened or some things that people said or certain parts of my diagnosis, but being able to have that in a journal, I can look back at that and see. And then I also journal and blog for other people to read because I do like to let other people know that they're not alone. So um, last year I actually wrote a blog post and I called it the cancer lake. And I basically used these just uh, situations that I felt like I was stuck in this lake as a metastatic patient. And 
the lake was filled with all other kinds of breast cancer patients, except all of the other breast cancer patients could be saved out of the lake. People could come and get them and they could go back to the shore and they could celebrate. And I was just stuck in this lake. And sometimes when I was in this lake, I would drown a little bit. My head would go underneath the water because I would get so tired from trying to tread water. And I just wanted to kind of let myself go and let myself into that darkness, but I would pop back up. And then sometimes I would just float and I would enjoy the sun and, you know, I would celebrate when other people came and they got rescued by this boat. And me explaining it like that is such a visual representation of what was in my brain that was so hard to um, really explain in words, but visually interpreted as such. So many people just connected with that writing and they were like, oh my gosh, I feel the same exact way. And not only is it good for other people, it was good for me. It was, it was good for me to be able to know that what I think in my head, I'm not alone either. And I have all these other people with me. So whether you're writing for yourself or you write for other people, writing is just a, a very great um, therapeutic tool. It's great for wellness. Even if you want to just check, you know, every day, like list three things that you're thankful for. Um, being able to list those things out and write them and get them out of your head and onto paper and being able to go back and read all those things is almost like a checklist. It really helps keep your, your brain in balance. One of my favorite things to say is there's no such thing as perfect. So I think that we can all look back on our lives and we had this idea growing up, um, especially if you grew up, you know, if, if you're, you know, older, if you're me or older, um, our lives kind of revolved around the Disney princess fairy tale life. And we you know, we're going to just have this, this perfect life with these perfect kids and this perfect husband and this perfect house. And we were just going to be June Cleaver and everything was going to be great. And that didn't happen. You know, uh, life did not go as we thought that it was going to go. So we, we really do have to give up on the idea of, of having that perfect life. We have to let it go. And the only way we can really let that go is to grieve it. So you just don't have to have somebody die to be able to grieve. You can grieve over anything. Um, and a big piece of the grieving process is accepting uh, what you're going through and then moving towards a place where you say, yes, this did not go, this life didn't go how I thought it was going to. This life is not great sometimes, but it's okay. You're, you're still okay. It's okay to be okay with your life. It's okay to have an imperfect life. It's okay to not love your life. Not everybody is going to love every single aspect of their lives, even if they don't have cancer. So moving towards a state of acceptance after that is, is something that really helps to get you going. Uh, what makes it so challenging getting to that acceptance part is when you try to resist it and you try to detach yourselves from what's happening in your reality. When you almost like you pretend like it didn't happen, like you didn't go through those things. Um, you really do have to change how you look at it and change your relationship towards having had cancer. So instead of looking at cancer as, you know, this terrible 
absolutely scary thing that you're never going to get over, you can change your relationship with it by just saying, yes, I accept this happened. This happened to me. It wasn't fair. Um, it wasn't supposed to be this way, but I accept that it happened and I'm ready to just be okay. And I think being okay is great. So now we move on to, you know, our new life after cancer. And if you look at this slide, this is actually a picture that I took. I was, I was reading a book by Lisa Turkhurst. And um, Lisa Turkhurst is a, a Christian author, but she was diagnosed with breast cancer shortly after um, she found out that her husband was cheating on her. So life was not going the way that, you know, Lisa thought it would for her. She thought because she believed in God and she was this Christian and she, you know, devoted her life to God that she was going to have this, you know, perfect marriage, perfect life, perfect kids. And that's not what happened at all. So the part that's highlighted says, sometimes to get your life back, you have to face the death of what you thought your life would look like. So there's so many things that cancer really took away from me, but there's so many things that it hasn't taken away. Cancer's never crushed my soul. It's never crushed who I am as a person. Sometimes maybe it crushes my spirit, but it's never eradicated the love that I have in my heart. It's never gotten rid of the love I have for my friends and my family. It has dampened my dreams at time, but never my hope. My hope that one day everything will be okay and tomorrow will be a better day. It's taken away peace from me at times, but not my trust that things will get better. And I really have gained so much in the past almost 10 years than compared to what I think that I've lost. And I think that if you all go through your cancer journeys and you really take a hard look at everything it's taken away, but you write down everything that you've gained, um, even by you being here, you talking to Jen, you now having these groups, um, these new friends in your lives, those are things that you wouldn't have had. Um, so cancer, while it's not a blessing, it's not a blessing at all, cancer has given us, you know, a lot of things that we would not have had. And I really did have to let go of what I thought my life was going to be. And I haven't done that just once. I've done it multiple times. I, I've let go of what I thought life was going to be like after my daughter died, then after I had my kids, then after I was diagnosed. And even this past March, my son was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And so many times I have had to reshape myself and I've had to let go of normal and I've had to really kind of dwindle myself down to nothing so that I could rebuild everything. And I can unequivocally guarantee you that I am not the person I am today because of cancer. I am the person I am today because of everything I've gained through cancer. Um, People like Jen and having a community are things that have all gotten me through. They have all refocused me. They've all rejuvenated me and they've all kept me going. And uh, that's it. And I just want to thank you again, Jen, for having me. Um, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok. I'm a terrible TikTok person and I I absolutely love making TikToks and I share a lot of dark humor because dark humor also gets me through life and, and this crazy cancer journey. <laughs>